Welcome along to another episode of the Saints FC podcast hosted on the Ugly Insides YouTube channel. And this week we have another exclusive, another candid interview. John catches up this week with former Saints captain Dean Hammond. He led Saints on the field through three fantastic seasons that saw Saints win the Johnston Paints Trophy and secure back-to-back promotions from League One to the promised land to the Premier League. Now, Dean Hammond played over 120 games for the Saints, starring in a midfield for a team that contained Adam Lalana, Ricky Lambert, Morgan Schneidlin, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, and Jose Fon. Dean tells the podcast about what he considers to be his career highlights, what persuaded him to join the Saints and takes us through the two promotions on the journey back to top flight football. So without further ado, over to John for this week's Saints FC podcast. Welcome to episode 19 of the Saints FC podcast. Uh, This week, I have the great fortune of being able to catch up with Saints former captain Dean Hammond and talk about the good couple of seasons he had at Southampton. Um, We go over the very famous uh, victory at Wembley in the Johnson's Paint Trophy and getting promoted from League One to the Championship and then, of course, from the Championship to the Premier League as well. Uh, Dean tells us about his career highlights, um, why he decided to join the club despite it being down in League One and also about how he managed to swear live on the BBC and perhaps what his parents might have thought of that. Um, As always... uh, We'd love to hear from you. So if you do want to get in touch with the podcast, you can email us saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com. You can contact us on Twitter at saintsfcpodcast. And you can, of course, leave us a review on iTunes or whatever the podcasting app that you decide to listen to this through. Um, We'll check all of those and be delighted to hear from you. Um, I must also highlight that... uh, This week I had a pretty cool experience where I got to head down to the Staplewood training ground um, and meet some of the key Southampton staff, including the manager Maurizio Pellegrino himself. So next week's episode, I'll be um, digging out uh, what my experience of the day was and have a couple of the questions uh, answered by Maurizio on how Saints are getting on this season. Um, But anyway, let's uh, head over and hear from Dean now. Right, so hello everyone. Uh, Welcome to the Saints FC podcast. Um, I am absolutely delighted to have uh, a real kind of like Saints legend of a fantastic time um, for Southampton. Um, And that's Dean Hammond on the line. So Dean, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, how are you having? Yeah, not not too bad, Dean. Um, I thought I kind of lost you there for a second. (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm still here. I'm still here. All right, that, that's great. Um, Dean, thank you very much for, for joining us on the show. Um, in, in case there's any Saints fans that listen to this that, that um, don't uh, know who you are, um, I can't imagine there's that many because it's not too long ago that you're at Southampton, but um, you joined Saints when we're down in League One, um, minus 10 points, and you stuck with us for three quite glorious seasons with a winning of the Johnson's Paint Trophy in the first season, promotion from League One to the Championship in your second season and then promotion from the Championship to the Premiership in your third season, which was uh, quite an impressive time uh, to be at Saints. And not only that, you actually captained the side uh, throughout that time. And I'll ask you a little bit about your captaincy. Um, So I guess, you know, just to get started, um, I wonder if you can tell us about your transfer to Saints, um, you know, why you joined the Saints, what, what drew you there and what sealed the deal for you? Well, uh, uh, obviously, joining a massive club like Southampton, um, knew the history of the football club, um, um, the size of it, 
um, the ambition of it. And I know it was in League One at the time, but um, I was playing at Colchester at the time. Um, had a phone call from um, from my agent, and had a phone call from from Dean Wilkins to see if I'd be interested um, in joining Southampton. Um, and obviously, as soon as I heard of the interest, um, I was very interested. Wanted to get it done. Wanted to sign because. Um, I've been trying to build through my career and try to get to um, a big club uh, to try and progress my career. So as soon as I knew Southampton were interested, I wanted it to happen. It dragged out for a little bit. Um, I think I knew of the interest at the beginning of the pre-season, but then probably didn't sign for Southampton until um, midway through August. So I think we played the first two games of the season when I was at Colchester, uh, the famous game where we beat Norwich 7-1 at Carroll Road. Um, um, and then I think I signed um, about two weeks later. So was absolutely delighted to sign for the football club and couldn't get away to start it because um, I've been sold the club of the ambition um, of the owner of, of Nicola uh, Cortese and obviously Alan Pardew being manager and me knowing Dean Wilkins from um, Brighton when I was youngster. So, yeah, that, that's how it really came about. Yeah, because I, I guess, you know, on the face of it, um, to join a club that is in League One, has minus 10 points, might not necessarily kind of stand out as being particularly appealing. But um, you mentioned Alan Pardew and Nicola Cortese. Um, Nicola seemed to have quite a big role to play in the transfers of players in that time. And, and he was always talking about these big plans for the Saints. What, what were the plans for the club at that time? Well, the plans for the club that Nicola and, and, and Alan Pardew and, and Dean Wilkins sold to me was that the club wanted to get back to the Premier League and it was a realistic ambition. I think it was, if I can remember rightly, um, it was a five-year plan to try and get back to the Premier League from, from League One. Um, at the time, we were on minus 10 points in, in League One, so the first season was probably always going to be an uphill challenge and, and difficult. Um, but it was a no-brainer for me because... Alan Pardew was manager, who had obviously been a premiership manager at the top level, had a good reputation in the game, so he was going to Southampton to be part of something special. Um, they just signed and spent some, uh, a lot of money on a player like Ricky Lambert, who I played against in the lower league, so I knew of his quality. Um, and like I said before, I knew the history of the football club, the size of it. Um, and speaking to Nicola, um, the day I signed, um, he sold the club to me, the ambition, and obviously you could just see in himself he was a passionate man and he, he was going to fulfill what what he promised. So um, it, it was easy for me to sign for, for a club like Southampton. Um, I'd played at the stadium before. I'd seen the training ground. I played there when I was younger because I'm reasonably local from, from Sussex uh, to Hampshire. So, yeah, it was an easy decision for me. And like you say, Nicola was... Very ambitious and wanted to get to the top, and he did. He proved everyone right and proved himself right. Um, and it was quite a first season for you. I think uh, you had 53 appearances over the season, scored a, a few goals as well. Um, you know, did you think that like as soon as you got there, you'd be established in the in the in the team, and you'd be um, you know getting goals? And, and, and were you expecting to be like you know right in the thick of it right from the very start? Well, you, you never know. Obviously, going to Southampton, I knew there was quality players and there was going to be competition for places. But um, I think like any footballer, you believe in your own ability. You go to a football club to play. Um, I wanted to play, obviously, for, for Southampton and have an impact on, on the club and the squad and try to help and try to win games. Um, so as, a, as an individual, as a player, you believe you're, you're going to play and you want to be in the thick of the action. Um, and obviously playing in midfield, you, you generally are in that position. Um, but I knew it would be a challenge because um, there was quality players at the football club. There was good youngsters coming through uh, through the youth system like they always have done at Southampton. And there were some more experienced players there. And then, um, so you had Paul Watton there who was, you know, been, he'd played in the championship for years. You had a very young Morgan Snydlin. Um, so I knew I had players that I had to compete against, but like every footballer, you believe in your ability and you believe that you should play. So um, I just wanted to get there, get the opportunity and take my chance. And I think I did that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you mentioned a few of the players um, that were at Saints when you started. Um, a lot of them, you know, have go- gone on to have you know quite established careers um, in the Premier League. Some of them are regular internationals now. I mean, obviously Jose Fonts has now won the the European Cup. Ricky Lambert went on and scored uh, and played for England, as did Alex Oxley Chamberlain. Schneidlin, a, a regular in a really really fantastic. Um, French side Adam Lallana as well playing quite regularly for England I mean when you got to the club there did it feel like the players that you had were were much better than League One or or, I mean I suppose if you look at it now would you have been quite surprised that those players have all gone on to have like such illustrious careers or, or or you know was it really obvious as soon as you got in there I wouldn't be surprised because obviously when I went into the football club um Individually, the players that you mentioned were, were, were talented players. They had every attribute, um, technically very good, strong, quick. Um, um, so individually, I could see good players. Obviously, you can never predict um, they were going to do what they did. But what the club did for them in terms of Alan Pardew and people like Dean Wilkins, everyday working, and, not, and Nigel Atkins in, in, the, in the future, um, was give them a foundation and give them an understanding of the game, a real structure within a team. So they had all the tools and the attributes to be top-class players, um, but playing football and being successful as players is, is very different um, in a team. And the, the coaches and the football club gave them that structure. And because of that, and because of them themselves, obviously, um, and the work rate they had and the desire they had, they, they improved as players. Um, so, yes, to your question, I could see that they were talented players um, and had the attributes to get to the top, but people like Dean Wilkins, Alan Pardew, Nigel Atkins, the coaches um, at the football club at Southampton, give them a real understanding of the game and, 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 and implementing the winning mentality into them, which would again have improved their game uh, um, as footballers. Yeah, absolutely. And what was it like having Alan Pardew as your manager? What, what was his style? What was a kind of a typical, you know, game day or training day w- with him? Uh, he was. I enjoyed working under, and he was. Um, he was a good manager, uh, a good man manager. Um, took the didn't take all the training, um, but took the important sessions. I would say in terms of shape and structure and the way we were going to play. Um, will give you a clear message so there was no doubt into what he wanted you, from you as a, an individual player and as a team. He would uh, speak to you at certain times, uh, wouldn't speak to you all the time, not in a bad way, just when he had something to say to you, he would say it to you. Um, but I enjoyed playing under him and it, it, the one thing he did give, a, give us all, he taught us how to win football matches again um, and you know really started the momentum of the football club and and where it got from from League One to uh, the Premier League. So, no, I enjoyed working under Alan. And and did you kind of ever think that you might actually even sneak into the playoffs? Because I know you started on minus 10 points, but you, you only finished, what, six or seven points off the playoff positions by the end of the season. Or, or was it just a, a big, a bit of a stretch too far? No, not at all. I mean, that, that was the aim in the first season, to try and get into the playoffs. Um, and we knew if we could put some consistency together and some results together um, before January, we knew the club would strengthen again. And I think we did in, in January. I think, and I can't remember everyone we brought in, but I think we brought people like Lee Barnard in and, and Jason Punch and um, Dan Seaborn, I think, um, Jose Fonta, I think, came in. So we knew if we could get to January and we were in a, a healthy position um, and had moved up the table a bit that we could give it a, a really good push. Um, so we always felt as though we could make it. I think that season, uh, just a few more teams were a little bit more consistent than us. We put a really good run together at times, um, especially towards the end, but then just lost the odd game where we needed to win. I think one game I can remember, we was on a really good run, I think, and we played Swindon at home and lost 1-0, I think, to them, and that kind of killed our momentum a bit. And We just unfortunately just missed out at the end, but... The thing that really gives us momentum was was the cup run in the in the Paints Trophy, which we obviously won uh, and got to Wembley and won that trophy, which was fantastic. But 
you know, Alan Pardew was big on that. He, he wanted us to win games. He wanted us to win every game. And he believed that competition could give us real momentum for the league. And it did. But unfortunately, we just, we just came up short. Yeah. A lot of my friends who support kind of perhaps bigger clubs, you know, kind of laugh when I suggest that winning the Johnson's Paint Trophy was brilliant. But it was absolutely brilliant. It was a fantastic day out for the fans. Um, what was it like playing at Wembley with that big Southampton crowd that showed up and, and then winning just, you know, so emphatically as well? Yeah, it was. It, I, I still to this day say it's one of the best days of my career. Obviously playing at the new Wembley um, was fantastic. Playing in front of so many Southampton fans, I think it was 50,000, 60,000 fans there. It was red and white everywhere. I think we had three quarters of the ground. Um, seeing what it meant to the fans and what it meant to us um, was fantastic and it was luckily it was quite a comfortable game with a with a four one win. I think we, we were four 0 up with twenty minutes to go, maybe something like that. If I can remember, we scored goals at, at good times. Um, probably the only disappointment for myself would be I didn't have the greatest performance because there wasn't a lot for us to do really. We were four 0 up. The you know the, the, the I'd say the important players, the flair players, uh, done their job, scored the goals, and, and won the game for us. So. Uh, for people like myself, it was maybe seeing the game out. But it was a day to enjoy because of the result we had and, and, and the way we won. Um, but I knew, I know it's easy to say now, um, but I always felt, you know, driving up to Wembley when we saw all the fans and um, the passion that they were showing and what it really meant to them because the last few years they've had at the football club, um, I think we all knew as a team we were going to, uh, not that we could just turn up, but it was just destined um, as a team and as a club to win that, to really um, push us on and catapult us to bigger and better things. Okay. Um, let's uh, move on to the next uh, season, which um, I think probably at the start of the 2010-2011 season, most Saints fans were probably expecting Southampton to get promoted, probably automatic promotion. Um, we're probably expecting Alan Pardew to stay as manager as well. And um, I, I guess things didn't really go so smoothly right at the start. We you know, perhaps didn't have the, the greatest start, lost the first two matches, but then beat Bristol Rovers 4-0. And then Alan Pardew was sacked, um, which seems you know, rather bizarre at the time. What did you make of, of that happening? Well, I agree with you. At the time, it was a, a bizarre decision and, and a strange decision. I didn't see it coming myself. I remember driving in to training on the Monday after we beat Bristol Rovers in a, in a really good performance as a team. It was a really good result um, there. Um, and just hearing it on the radio that Alan had been sacked. So it was a surprise to me. Um, I agree with you. We didn't start the season particularly well. I think we lost the first game to Plymouth at home, 1-0 or 2-0. Um, I think that was live on Sky. So we didn't start great. Um, we'd heard there'd been a, a few, uh, fr a little bit of friction between um, Nicola and, and, and Alan. I don't know what that was about, but because um, you know we felt as though then we had our, we had a few injuries. I think at the start of the season, that after that performance, we had our strongest team out. Um, we felt as though from that we could really push on. Um, so it was a surprise to me. Didn't see it coming, um, but these things happen in football, and obviously it's proven to be to be a good decision. Yeah, and and when you when they introduced Nigel Adkins to the team, where how did they do that? Did they did he just show up one one day and then he was there at training, or do they call a big meeting with all the players? Like how how does he get introduced to you guys? Well, generally you hear a few rumours in the squad. You obviously talk and. Uh, people hear things at the football club and it filters back to the players. So we, we knew, we knew Nigel was coming in. Um, we were told, um, I think, um, the chairman came in, uh, and told us that Nigel was going to be manager, um, and introduced Nigel to us. Um, and then we had a, a group meeting, um, as players, um, and Nigel and Andy Crosby and Dean Wilkins, um, came and introduced themselves and, uh, we just had a meeting about what we wanted to achieve at the football club, what Nigel wanted from us, what his ambitions were, 
um, how we wanted us to play, how we felt we should play. Um, did he want us to be, uh, basically, he wanted us to be a winning team, but, but winning the right way in terms of the way we played football. So, no, that, that was how he was introduced to us. We had a 15, 20 minute, meeting, 20 minute meeting with him to start with. And then we went out to, out to train and everything started from there. So he was introduced to us and then, um, just kind of settled in really quickly. Um, and as I can remember, I don't think results went great to start with. I think we drew or lost the first couple of games. Um, but it was always going to take a little bit of bed in him because, um, he wanted us to play a slightly different way, wanted us to play, I wouldn't say total soccer, but wanted us to pass it out from the back and move the ball quickly and play between the lines and yeah. create chances, get crosses in, score goals. So, you know, he was a manager that wanted to win football matches, but wanted to win them in um, the way and the style and the philosophy of, of Southampton Football Club. And what was the kind of the the magic that, Nigel Atkins had to actually, you know, get the players to get to win those two successive promotions. Because I guess kind of when you see him from from the fans' perspective, and you just see the kind of interviews on TV or, or, or read what he's written in the match day program, he seems to be very focused on on the attitude and um, you know trying to bring positivity to the, the players. He seems to be quite a lot a, a motivator, I suppose. But is he quite a, a good tactician as well? Yeah, he was... Um, Nigel was a very calm man. Um, you know, knowledge of the game. Uh, very focused. Um, very honest with you. Um, and, you know, wanted your opinion as players. Wanted the players' feedback. Would have meetings individually and as a group. Um, but tactically, yes always wanted to play um, always had two formations that we could swap in between games so if we started in one formation say a 4-4-2 and it wasn't working or the opposition were on top that we could change um, and we were comfortable doing that because we worked on it in training training was very important to him and his staff uh, we worked very hard in training there was great detail that went into training um, whether that was fitness or tactical, uh, team shape. So we were really well prepared. Um, and he was, he was a good, he was a good person to work under. He'd give a lot of responsibility to his coaches in Andy Crosby and Dean Wilkins. Um, obviously guided them what he wanted, but give them a, a responsibility. Um, and we used to take it. I know it sounds silly and boring and he used to say it, but we used to literally take it one game at a time and concentrate on who we were playing. And if we had to adapt, to who we were playing, their strengths and weaknesses, we would, and we would work on it during the week. Um, he was very much and very big on recovery, keeping players fresh, didn't want players getting injured, uh, which sometimes could have frustrated players. For example, I know Ricky Lambert always wanted to do more, more finishing, but he would want him to save his legs for the games. Um, so he had, he had different ideas on that and recovery. Um, and as players, I suppose we just had to adapt to it and get believed in it uh, and I think that's why we were so successful yeah, and do you have any kind of standout games from that season that, that you really remember um, you know, that, that you think kind of maybe symbolised how Southampton played in, in that promotion season uh, I'm not too sure really I think um, one of the first wins we had under um, Nigel Atkins I think we played Bournemouth at home and played uh, we put a really good performance in a real Passing performance, possession performance, scored a lot of goals. Um, but important, important victories, I would have to say, um, when we beat MK Dons at home after being 2 0 down, um, and 1 3 2. Uh, I think Lee Barnard got the winner. Uh, I think Jonathan Fulk came off the bench and scored two within three or four minutes. So that was a, a massive performance. Um, uh, the away win at Brighton after being 1-0 down and they were champions and the rivalry between the two clubs and and, and, and Jose scoring in the last minute, um, that was a, uh, an important result because it was so close between us and Huddersfield. You know, we'd win a game and the first question in the dressing room would be, how did Huddersfield get on? Because it was so tight between us. We were chasing Brighton, obviously, but Huddersfield were on our tail. So we knew we had to keep winning. Um but probably the biggest result and the best result would have to be the Plymouth game away when we won 
three one I think to basically secure his promotion back to the championship. I know it was uh, we technically weren't, but we were because the goal difference was so so big. So them games I mentioned would be the standout ones for me. Yeah. Uh, what about the one going back to Colchester United and and actually scoring against your old club? How, how did that feel? Yeah, it was. It's always nice to score against your old club, and um, I think we won two nil on the day, three one, something like that. So. Um, you know, it's always nice to go back to a former club and uh, and score. Um, but you know, I had a great time at Colchester, and I and I owe them a lot. Um, I had a really good time there, enjoyed my time there, improved as a player there. So uh, there's no malice in the celebrations or anything like that. Just enjoyed scoring because I didn't score that many in my career, so every goal counted for me. But yeah, it was nice to go back there um, and score. Um, and I think it wasn't wasn't too bad a finish. I think I think it was a bit of a hard folly I think if I can think rightly yeah <laughs> right so um let's let's go let's fast forward to the very very last day of the season like I said we pretty much know that we're promoted already um but it's at St Mary's completely full house and um you put in a, gr- a great performance against Walsall final whistle goes all the fans are on the pitch. You guys are, are all celebrating with the fans and then leading the chance. Tell us a little bit about that day because it, it was absolutely brilliant to be involved as a fan, but it must have been even more fantastic as a player. Yeah, I mean, it was. it's hard to describe, but yeah, obviously it was fantastic and the better, one of the best things going into We knew we were basically promoted. So um, after the Plymouth game, um, I think we played them on the Tuesday or the Wednesday night, um, we obviously had a few drinks after that and celebrated on the way home because obviously it's quite a long journey. Um, I had an evening out, so we didn't train much up leading up to the Walsall game. Um, but the first half, we put in a, a, a brilliant performance. I think probably one of the best of the seasons. I think we were 2-0 up at half-time, um, created lots of chances, played really relaxed football, enjoyed it. The atmosphere was brilliant. Coming out to the fans, it was a full house. Um, everyone's family and friends are there. So, yeah, it was great. And I think we tired a bit second half, ended up winning 3-1, I think it was. Um, I think um, Alex scored his first goal for the club uh, with a nice curling left foot. So, yeah, and, and the final whistle going and, and the crowd coming onto the pitch. You know, I'd never experienced anything like that in my career. You'd seen it on TV and always dreamed of, of having that feeling and experience of, of something like that as such a, at such a big club, but I think that moment really for me just made me realise that the size of the club it, it really is and really was because of the support there and what it really meant to the fans and you know the players sounds sounds funny but the players didn't really want to get off the pitch just wanted to celebrate with the fans and the fans were picking players up and lauding them around and it was just a fantastic day a fantastic time in the dressing room afterwards. Um, a great evening celebrating with family and friends and um, just something I look back on with, with great pride and I think all the, the rest of the players will do. And I, I think one of the things that I already remember from that was after they managed to get you guys off the pitch um, and get you up to the, I suppose, the kind of director's box or it was, I guess yeah. it's the kind of disabled yeah. section in front of the director's box. And then you guys were all there with your beers and, and leading yeah. the, the songs as well. What, what what was that like? I mean, did you have some particular songs? Were you hoping to get a Dean Hammond song in there? <laughs> I don't know. Really. I don't know if there was a Dean Hammond song. So. Um, no, obviously being up there and, and looking down at the pitch and seeing the fans and obviously the boys were buzzing and, and enjoying it. And we was with Mary, we were drinking, we were celebrating. And, um, you know, the players, because everyone loved being there, you know, training was brilliant every day. There was a great atmosphere between the boys. We knew all the songs that the fans sung. We used to sing them sometimes, you know, after a good victory and different things. So we knew all the songs. So we, like you said, we were starting the chants off and, and the songs and the fans were joining in. Just great memories, really. And obviously our families were up there as well and kids as well. So just a happy, safe environment to to celebrate a, um, a brilliant achievement. So, yeah, that was, that was a real highlight. And you don't really want it to end. At the time, you probably feel as though you're enjoy, enjoying it but you probably wish you'd enjoyed it a little bit more looking back on it um but it's just great memories great memories yeah and um 
I suppose uh, at the time, you know, Southampton, they have this thing with a team captain and a club captain. Um, you were team captain. Kelvin Davis was was club captain. What what kind of makes the role of captain? You know, what what is it that defines the role of captain for you? What what did you feel your responsibility was in that season and getting Saints promoted? Well, you know, Kelvin was was club captain and rightly so. So he was captain of the football club. What it how it came about just because obviously Galvin is a goalkeeper. Um, when I first got the opportunity and um, the role, was Alan Pardew wanted an outfield player, someone on the pitch to to, to wear the armbands and probably to help maybe some of the more um, less uh, experienced players speak to the referee, maybe have a little bit of an influence over the referee. Um, so that was my role really. Um, I got the privilege of obviously wearing the armband and, and, and leading the team out, but. Kelvin was was the captain of the football club. He was respected as a player, respected in the dressing room. He ran the dressing room really. Um, if you needed something, you go and speak to Kelvin. So my my role was more on the pitch really, um, just trying to influence the game as we were playing, speaking to people, um, giving advice, um, just trying to play out the game plan and give instructions to other players really. All right, yeah, f- fair enough. Very, very kind of diplomatic. Not saying that you're the the leader of the pack. Um, right, well, let's let's jump into the next season. So we get up to the championship. Um, I, you mentioned that Nicola Cortese's plan was you know a five year uh, journey to get back to the Premier League. At the start of the season, what was the expectation of you guys in the changing room? Honestly, yeah, we had a we had a meeting pre season. And, and, and the expectation from us and from the manager and the chairman was to get promoted again straight away. That was the ambition. That was what was put in front of us. That's what we were told we 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 should achieve because of the quality we had in the dressing room, because of the quality that was being added to the squad um, in terms of Jack Cork and um, uh, Danny Fox, I think, and uh, Steve De Ridder. So it wasn't major... Um, changes, but just the, the quality we had in the squad, um, the ambition was to get promoted again. Uh, we believed we could, um, especially the way we were playing football. We 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 felt physically we were ready for the championship. We were quite a big side. We were a fit side. Um, the way we played the game, we believed um, we could we could compete in the division. We obviously knew we had to prove that, and we had to get off to a good start. Um, but that was. That was the plan and the outline from pre-season, and that was the first day back. We had that meeting, um, and we just just went from it from that point, and, and and just you know started the season really well, and it just continued from there really. Yeah, and I, I suppose you kind of kicked things all off, didn't you? Ten minutes into the season, you're playing a club um, like Leeds United, who I know they've been in the Championship for years, but they really are probably one of the biggest clubs in terms of the history in, in in the whole kind of English football league and you score after 10 minutes and we pretty much don't look back from there do we it's, it's just a rampage through the championship yeah I mean we knew we had to start the season well and uh, the first game I think was live in the sky against Leeds and um, fortunate enough to score with uh Score my left foot. Well, I think it was probably the only time I used it in my career, so um, <laughs> it, was quite, it, was, it was quite nice. Um, so yeah, it, it was a good start and a good result. And I think we laid down a, a bit of a marker to to show that that we were serious. I mean, personally, I didn't actually think I was starting that game. Um, I'd been here almost of the week leading up to the game. Um, I'd missed the last pre-season game against Yeovil, I think it was. Um, so assumed that um, Jack Cork and Morgan were going to start. Um, but no, I got told on the Friday well, the, the gaffer named the team on the Friday, and I was starting. So personally, wanted to take that with both hands because I knew the competition was red hot, and I knew I, I had to perform every game. But like you said, we we got that result, and we never really looked back. And I think we won the home form at the start of the season was fantastic. The second game we played, I think we went away to Ipswich, did we? No, Barnsley, I think, or Ipswich. And yeah, but it's Barnsley was second game, and then Ipswich was the third game. Yeah, and I think Barnsley, we only won 1-0, but we played some great football that day. Um, and then we went to Ipswich on the Tuesday night um, and beat them 5-3. So 
I think people would would start to take notice and thought, you know, they've won their first three games here. But we've not only won them, we've won them comfortably and won them um, in a bit of style as well. So, and like you said, that just continued on. Obviously, we had our ups and downs and we lost games. But I think one thing we did and we always did during the season, if we lost a game, I think we managed to, not every time, but most of the time, win the next game. That was important to us. We made that kind of... You know, if we lose a game, right, put that to bed, that's finished, and make sure we get a result in the next game. And I think that generally happened during the season. And, and St Mary's was a real fortress, um, you know, during that season. I think you mentioned you had a really good start to the season at St Mary's. You didn't actually drop a point at St Mary's until the 10th of December, um, but, you know, which is a, astonishing, really, you know, really, really great form. Um, and, yeah, it continues on. I think it's a real shame you guys didn't quite manage to to win the title because you're pretty much top of the league through the, the whole season until probably dropped a couple of points. Um, I loathe to say it, but, you know, uh, against, uh, you know, firstly Blackpool, then Portsmouth, which obviously is very upsetting. Um, and then Reading as well. He, I think uh, Reading were the ones which ended up kind of leapfrogging you guys and, and winning the title in the end. Yeah, I mean, I was a fair play to, uh, to, to Reading. Um, I think they won 16, 17 out of the last 19 games, something like that, and went on a fantastic run. And uh, maybe that was the only downfall to to us. We had that little bit of inexperience at that level, and and they managed to catch us in the end. Um, us being a new team to the championship, but yeah, I would say probably like you mentioned, we played you know we played Pompey twice that year and, and drew both games. Uh, one all at Fratton Park, I think it was, and, and two all at St Mary's, where we scored in the last minute, I think, or the last couple of minutes, and then they ended up scoring in, in injury time. So, and then losing to Reading um, towards the end of the season at home, three-one, um, I think, if I can remember, um, was probably they're the low points of the season. But I can't really say it's a low point. You know, we've no. just been promoted from League One to the Championship, and then we got promoted straight to the Premier League. So, in the start of the season, we would all t- all have taken that. So, um, I can't even say the negatives really. But if you're talking about negatives and things you might change about season, they would be the point. It, it, it is slight nitpicking, really, that isn't it? So, I mean, let's <laughs> let's let's focus on the really good things. What were the highlights of that season for you? Um. Probably, you know, the biggest thing for me was, you know, the competition I had midfield with myself, Chappie, uh, Morgan, um, and Jack Cork was, you know, it was, in my opinion, that's really, that's four really good midfield players. So just to play as many games as I did to compete with them, them players, you know, Morgan's gone on to represent his country, plays regularly in the Premier League. Same for Jack Cork. Uh, Chappie's played at the highest level. Um, so to compete with them players was, you know, was a test for me and a challenge. Um, Games-wise, beating West Ham at home was um, uh, a great result. I think that really showed that we we meant business in the division. Um, scoring on the opening day against Leeds is all, was was always nice for myself. Um, beating Brighton at home, I think four 0 was was always nice. Beating your old club, so there was many highlights and. In that season, and, and obviously the last day of the season when uh, we beat Coventry um, so decisively and, and so well was just rounded it all off, and it was another fantastic day. I, th- I think that was one of the best days ever, probably. <laughs> it was just uh, so good. It, yeah, I mean, it, it was amazing, really. And but on that game was a difference because we knew we had to win, so there yeah. was some pressure on that. The previous season, we technically knew we were promoted, uh, but we just we trained actually that week. We trained mainly at the stadium uh, on the pitch. Uh, we, we'd never done that before, really. I think Nigel just wanted us um, to feel comfortable in the environment, so we trained on the pitch all week. Um, I don't think the grounds was too, was too happy with that, but he got over that um, and just went into went into the game with real confidence, but obviously nervous because we knew what it really meant. We knew we had to win to start the game so well. Um, and just, you know, it was a great day. Unfortunately for myself, I got injured after about 20 minutes, so I had to go off. Um, so I, I enjoyed the first 20 minutes. I think I went off at 2-0, uh, 
um, and then just watched the rest of the game from the sidelines and just um, soaked up the atmosphere. So, like you said, it was just a real memorable and fantastic day. And, and were you lifted above the heads of uh, fans when you got on or, or onto the pitch, or did you manage to avoid that? Was they just kind of lifted? No, I managed there? to avoid that and I managed <laughs> to do an interview on BBC and swear on TV. So I done that <laughs> instead. So <laughs> I won't ever forget that. But no, I was on the sidelines and. I'd hurt my legs, so I tried not to get involved with the crowd, which I feel was always a bit of a shame. I'd wish I'd been on there at the end again um, and celebrated with the fans, uh, but it wasn't to be. And the main thing was obviously winning the game and getting promotion. So fantastic day and being able to share it again with uh, when we're going up the tunnel and the, with the players and the wives and the kids were there at the end of the tunnel, was just before the dressing room um, and seeing them and seeing how happy they were and being able to celebrate with them and the atmosphere in the dressing room afterwards was unbelievable. It's just moments you don't really want to come out of and you don't want to finish. Um, we celebrate in the evening, later, um, everyone together. Uh, and Southampton were great at doing that. They, you know, if you achieved, you were uh, rewarded um, and they wanted your family, your wife and your kids to be part of that. So credit to the football club to doing that because they, they saw it that, you know, the players achieved and, um, played the games, but there was people behind the scenes within the football club that had such an impact and such, done such an important job. And, and obviously the sacrifice that um, wives and kids have to put up with when you're miserable and you're down and you're tired and things like that. So it, it was rightly that we celebrated all together. And that was probably one of the best memories. Yeah, I mean, I, an absolute kind of fantastic day. And yeah, like you say, to win 4-0 um, just really drove home how good it was and um uh yeah really kind of fantastic to beat west ham united as well i had a, a five pound bet with a friend who supported west ham and you know obviously five pounds was completely meaningless uh in, in terms of the bet you know in comparison to getting promoted to the premier league but you know gave that, that extra bragging rights as well um so i suppose you know it gets the end of the season and um it's nearly the end of your kind of saints career at this point but um what, what did you expect going into the Premier League? Were you expecting to kind of be part of the squad or, you know, what, how how did you approach the summer and, and getting ready for that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I expected to be part of the squad. I knew the club would, would reinvest, reinvest heavily and bring good players in. I expected that. I was I was happy for that to happen because it meant the club were moving forward. Um, it was just another challenge for myself um, that I needed to to attack really so I went back pre-season probably I'd never worked so hard um, in, in the summer I didn't actually have a holiday that summer because we just had uh, um, our second child my wife was pregnant so we had our, my second child Jude um, during, that, during that period um, so yeah I was going into the season optimistic um, thinking that I would be part of it probably realistically knew I wouldn't probably wouldn't pay such a major part um, but didn't feel as though my Saints career would would probably come to an, an end as it did um, but yeah it was it was a reasonably tough time at, at the time you know my, I just mentioned we, ha- we had our son but he ended up during pre-season um, having meningitis and was in hospital so that was difficult um, and actually had to make a, a difficult decision because um, the day the night he got it um, we played in that tournament at St Mary's where there was us, Arsenal, I can't remember the other the other teams. Um, and then we went away to Switzerland uh, the next day um, and my son was taken ill that evening. Um, and I actually went away for pre-season to Switzerland because, you know, it had taken all my career to, to actually get to the Premier League, I wasn't really going to let this chance slip. I had a, a, a the meeting with the hospital and the doctors about my son and they reassured me that he wasn't in, in huge danger and the club reassured me that if um, there was any problems that they would fly me fly me back over. So, yeah, it was a difficult period for me but still optimistic and um, a difficult decision to maybe, wrongly or rightly, put my career maybe a little bit before my family but and then not to actually play in the Premier League for Southampton was was difficult, but I suppose that's football, really. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty gutting when you put uh, something like that on on the line, or you know, 
God, try and imagine what it, uh, the kind of grief that I would get from my wife if I put. Uh... <laughs> I do, don't worry. I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it must be awful because you know you, you obviously desperately want to be there for your, for your son as well. Um, but yeah, like you say, your, your whole career has built up to this moment and this opportunity. Um, yeah, absolutely gutting for it not to work out, but. Um, you, know, you, you then went uh, on loan and, and left Southampton quite early on. So di- did you kind of not think, well, actually, I'm going to refuse this loan opportunity. I'm going to stay in the squad and fight a bit and see if I can get into the squad. Or, or did you kind of realise at that point that you weren't going to be part of Nigel's plans? No, I never really, to be honest, I never really didn't see myself or was never told I wasn't part of the plans really um, it's easy to look back on things and now you make a decision at the time that you think's right and, and the best um, for your career I had an honest and open conversation with Nigel Nigel was great um, very honest with me um, wanted me at the football club wanted me to stay but couldn't couldn't promise me game time couldn't promise um, that I was going to play I wasn't going to play um, so I wasn't I wasn't encouraged to leave. I wasn't in a hurry to leave. Um, but Brighton came in in for me. Um, that was that was a real, really good opportunity for me. Uh, a club that was um, just moved into a new stadium. Uh, it was my local club. I come through the youth system there. Um, I knew some players there. I knew they were ambitious. So, um, you know, it was a really difficult decision to leave to Southampton because. I joined the club in League One and the ambition was always to try and get to the Premier League. We've made it to the Premier League and um, I always wanted to just play in the Premier League. I mean, that was my ultimate ambition as a footballer and to come so close and obviously with the, the story and the, and, and the club of, of Southampton. But it wasn't meant to be and I made a decision at the time to leave. I left on good terms with the, with the manager, the, the, the owner, uh, the players, um, the fans, I hope. So, um, difficult decision, but I felt I needed to do it for my career and um, probably worked out for the best in the end because Southampton has moved on to bigger and better things. Um, the competition and the players that they sign now is fantastic. And, you know, the club's moved on and, and I've moved on and I had a great time there and an opportunity came back to go to uh, my local club um, that were doing well in the championship and an ambition to get to the Premier League. So it kind of worked on all fronts. But it, yes, it was a difficult decision. Yeah. So just kind of reflecting on that time at Saints, what what would you say was the biggest highlight in, in those three seasons? The biggest probably highlight, you know, I had a great three years, so it's difficult to, um, to, 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 to say really. But I'd probably say getting promoted from, the back-to-back promotions, I don't think you can beat. There's not many teams that have done it. Um, great achievement. Um, but the day the day at Wembley, which kind of started it all off, really, um, playing at the National Stadium, playing in front of all them fans, walking up the steps and lifting that trophy, um, I would say was probably the highlight of my career at Southampton, which is difficult to say because we went from League One to the Premier League. But... Um, but obviously, uh, captain in the club was was a, was an honour. Playing with such gifted players and and good people, they weren't just good players; they were good people as well. And the spirit in the dressing room, and you know, going into training every day was brilliant. Um, obviously, helped because we were winning football matches, obviously. But we socialised together as a group. Um, everyone got on well. Uh, it was good fun. So difficult to pick a to pick a highlight, but. Probably the Paints Trophy, lifting the trophy at Wembley, I'd have to say. Yeah, uh, it, it was a really big highlight. I think probably for me it would have been that um, that final game against Coventry. I think that that was was the real moment. But the Johnson's Paint Trophy, I'm going to remember that day for the rest of my life, uh, and really, really <laughs> fondly. So, um, yeah, great. And and um, out of the players that you played with, um, you got to pick one. Who, who's the most talented player that you played with during the, your time at Saints? <sighs> Well, you put me on the spot now. Um, it's not. A, it's not. It's a very difficult decision. But you know, the players I play with, you, like you're saying, you're talking about international footballers now. Players that have played in the Premier League. Um, Ricky Lambert, who's an absolute legend at the football club, and he kind of.
scored so many goals and was a huge reason why we got promoted. Um, that back-to-back promoters and the club was so successful. Um, Morgan Snyderlin, Jason Pungent, Luke Shaw, um, Oxley Chamberlain, Jose Fonte, Calvin Davis. I mean, I can't mention everyone, but I'd have to say the most talented and most gifted player would have to be Adam Lallana. Um but just not just because of that, but because of his work rate, his desire to to improve every day he was probably the best trainer every day. Loved training, was devastated when he was injured. Um, was a winner. Um, didn't mind an argument in the training in in the dressing room if he you know expressed his views if he felt something was wrong or someone needed something needed saying he would say it. Um, so just as an all round package and as a player as a person, I'd have to say Adam Lallana. You can't question Adam and Alana over football because he was just... But to be fair, he's just a top bloke. He's a great lad. Great lad as well, which is just... And you're just, you're just so happy that he's doing well and he's just improving every season. I mean, at Liverpool now, he's almost the, the main player. So he's just had a great career and long may it continue. Yeah. I, um, last, uh, last time I did the podcast, I was speaking to um, a journalist who works for The Guardian and the Tasty Football Show, and he thinks Adam Lallana is actually England's key player at this point. He thinks that, you know, looking at the last two England games, the thing that they were lacking was Lallana linking midfield to the, you know, the talent that we have up front, which astonishing, really, to think, you know, that he was, I suppose, relatively mature in his England career and, and had those early seasons in in League One and the Championship to kind of get to those heights where he's sorely missed by the national team when he's not available. Yeah, I mean, I mean that is the quality he's got. He is, he is honestly that good. Um, technically, he's as good as. It's weird. He's almost not like a natural English player. He's more like a, a technical foreign player or a foreign player who would look at and think, well, you know, he's technically brilliant. He, he is that. Um, but his work effort and his desire as well, I think they've missed that. And he's just a clever footballer. He can play wide. He can play a number 10 role. I think he could play centre midfield. Um, he's getting stronger and it looks like he's even getting quicker. Um, but I agree with him. He's probably England's most, most effective player now and just has a real impact on the game with what he does. Um, even his unselfish runs where he's running behind and might not get the ball. He'll, he'll do that for other people. Um, but like I said, you know, earlier in the interview, he's, he had a really good grounding in terms of coming from League One to the Championship to the Premier League. So he learned his football and he learned the industry and he learned and understood the game. And that natural talent he had just kept blossoming because he understood the game and, and the ground that he did get at a lower level. And, you know, at the time he probably wanted to play higher, but it's probably worked out best for him that he did come through the route he had. Um, so let, let's move on to kind of stuff that, that's happened since the Saints. Um, you've been at Leicester City for a pretty interesting time. So um, you joined the club uh, um, and, and got promotion, I think, in your first season there. Am I am I right in thinking that? Yeah, we did, yeah. Yeah, and then um, you got to the Premier League. You finally got to play in the Premier League in, in quite a tumultuous season, but eventually secured... Um, you know, survival at the end of the season. What was it like being with Nigel Pearson? Because he was obviously a, a Saints manager and he um, kind of pulled us out of a relegation battle and, and helped us survive on the last day of the season when we were in the championship and kind of slowly working our way down the divisions. Um, he looks like quite a fierce man. <laughs> he's, he's got a presence, Nigel. Nigel Pearson's got a presence. He's a good manager. Um, I would say he's, he's a manager. Um, he's got coaches around him that would, would take the training. Um, when I was there, he was, he was, you know, he was very good with the players, um, spoke to the players, had the authority that you respected in him. Um, but you could approach him, approachable, nice man as well. Um, could have a laugh and a joke with him. But, um, when it came to football, very serious and very passionate. So no, he was good to work under and I can see why, you know, he had a, a successful did he keep the Saints up? I think when he was at Southampton. Yeah, he, um, he did. Yeah, and then uh, then he went to Leicester the first time he was at Leicester, and the following season we got relegated and they stayed up. Yeah, so he, you know, he's had a good career as a manager, and I enjoyed working under him, um, just because he's honest with you. Um, he tell you what it is. He tell you exactly what he thinks. Gives his opinion. I think as a player, you might not agree with it, but you respect it. 
Um, so yeah, I had an enjoyable time working under him, um, and really enjoyed it. Um, and then you got to work under Claudio Ranieri, and you were, I mean, not a big part of the, I suppose, the Leicester City kind of winning Premier League winning squad, but you were there or, you know, in the club during that incredible season, which I wonder if we'll ever see anything like it again in, in football. <laughs> well, probably not, to be honest, but no, it was one of those, we'd been promoted to the Premier League, we had a, the first season under Nigel Pearson, you know, we had a really good start and then we had a, a really difficult period and then we had, which Leicester class as, as the great escape where we won, um, I think we won seven out of the last nine games and ended up staying com- staying up comfortably where, um, you know, we were everyone, in everyone's eyes relegated. So that gave us real momentum. And during that season um, where we were fighting relegation, we, we never really got beat heavily. Um, we only had probably lost by the odd goal. I think the most was by two goals. So we knew we could play at the level. We knew we could play Premier League football was in the squad and the players. And then we won all them games at the end of the season. It just gave us real belief. Obviously, Nigel getting sacked in the summer was a surprise. A little bit like when Alan Pardew got sacked. But these things happen in football. And, and Claudio came in. And the best thing that, that Claudio did and, you know, just shows the intelligence of the man was he didn't change anything. He didn't change too much, which went against his beliefs, really. And his it's probably his managerial career and where we come from in terms of an Italian manager where they're used to doing double sessions, um, changing the, the style of training, style of play. Um, but he listened to the players. The players, you know, we had a meeting and the players asked him to to to, to give us a chance to, to play like we did at the end of last season because we've been so successful with it and won so many games. He did that. Um, and obviously the season just took off, kept winning games, confident grows, uh, confident grows as a team and, and individual players, and uh, the rest is history, and, and, and the boys went on to, to win the Premier League. Uh, um, and what did you feel, kind of, how, how did you feel about your role in it? Did you expect to be part of the first team squad at the start of the season, or did you kind of know that your career was was moving more towards the kind of like coaching period of life and kind of being just like an older player in the squad and perhaps being the arm around the shoulder of the younger players and... <laughs> yeah well you do you know when you're realistic now and you're getting a bit older and you see the younger boys flying around and doing different things and you think you know it used to be me but I can't quite do that anymore and you know the start of that season we won the Premier League I was on the bench um, for the first couple of games and then very similar to what happened at Southampton, really. Um, the club invested in two midfield players. Um, uh, one of them was Kante, which, you know, you can't really compete with Kante because of, you can see what type of player he is and um, what he's going to do in his career and has done in his career and how he performs. So, you know, he he was brilliant. Uh, I saw a couple of players coming, so I kind of saw the writing on the wall. Uh, saw maybe my, what my role in the squad would be, um, and as a player, you probably never like to admit it that you, you, your days are maybe coming towards an end, or you're not quite what you were. So um, I had an opportunity to leave the football club and went on loan to Sheffield United, um, which didn't quite work out for myself, and um, was a decision that I made at the time, which I thought was best for me, for best for, for the stage of the career I was at. It didn't work out. Uh, but that, like again, that that's football. Um, hindsight would have been better if I'd stayed at, the, at Leicester because they ended up winning the Premier League, and you never know what part you might have played. But they're decisions you make at the time. So um, can't really complain about my career. But um, yeah, you do, you do, your role does change within a football club. And I think there is. I was only thinking about it today when I was speaking to someone. There is a role at football clubs for older players, the right type of players that probably know they're not going to play as much, uh, but can have an influence in training, can pass on advice, pass on experience um, to players that are coming up, players that are playing, players that maybe are not playing. So you give a real good balance within the dressing room and within the squad that can help managers and, and, and coaches um, maybe control situations before they arise, really, if that makes sense. And um, what are you planning to do now? Because um, 
I think uh, you kind of went back to Leicester after the loan to Sheffield United. What, what's happening now in Dean Hammond's life? Well, uh, that, that what I just explained, really. I, I, after the loan to Sheffield United, I was out of contract and took a bit of time away from the game. We just had another uh, another baby uh, in my son, Noah. Um, so I took six, seven months away from the game, which, which was nice, but I miss, miss football like you do because it's your life. Um, and, and got an opportunity to go back to Leicester and I worked with the 23s doing a bit of, uh, I kind of created a role for myself as in a player mentor. So I would train with the 23 players, um, pass on some advice on and off the pitch, um, with the experiences I've had, um, set a standard in training and ended up playing a few games as well because you can play overage players in the 23s. Um, so yeah, it was great to go back there and work there. I've started my coaching badges. Um, which Leicester have helped me with, um, so going down that route. Um, but I, I enjoy the, I enjoy all aspects of football. So I enjoy recruitment and scouting and talking about the game. I've done some media work. So I'm not quite sure yet. I'm in, I'm in between. Um, yeah. But I want to be involved in football. It's been my life. I love football. I feel as though I can give something back because the sport's given me so much. So that's the stage I'm at. But I'd like to find my 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 passion again for, for the game, whatever route that would be. Trying trying out a few different things and, and seeing what sticks, I suppose. Yeah, exactly that. So um, I suppose, uh, I think, you know, we, we've been speaking for nearly an hour now, so I think we should kind of wrap it up. But before we do that, obviously we've got three of your former clubs are in the Premier League. Who's going to be doing the best out of Southampton, Leicester and Brighton this season? Oh, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, obviously, with Leicester just losing their manager or changing their manager, whoever that may come, I mean, it's difficult to make a decision on them. Um, Southampton, um, it's, it's, it's difficult for Southampton because it's such a, it's, it's a, the Premier League such a difficult division now, and there's so much competition. Everyone expects to do well in it, um, but you've got the top six, probably top seven clubs that are probably in their own little league and then it's can other clubs try and get into the top 10 try and have a good cup run um, so I'd probably say out of the three Southampton will probably have the best season I think they've got very good players they have a system that they play that the players understand um, probably not quite gone to plan yet or clicked into place but I think it will do um, because as a new manager, it takes time. There's new owners at the football club. So, but I'd have to mention Brighton have done really well as well. Um, I went and watched them on Sunday against Everton. Um, they look really solid as a unit, um, disciplined defensively. Probably not going to score the most goals in the Premier League, but probably won't concede many. So, they're going to have a good season as well. Um, but if Leicester can perform anything like um, they they did when they won the, the Premier League or performed in the Champions League last year. They'll have a strong season as well, especially with the players they have in Riyad Mahrez and Jamie Vardy. Um, so very close, I would say. But if you were putting, if I had to put some money on it, I'd probably say Southampton would finish the highest out of the top, out of the three of them. Yeah. And then on Sunday, the 29th of October, Saints are travelling down to the Amex Stadium to play your old club, Brighton. Who's going to win that game? What's your prediction? <laughs> um, looking at it now, I'd probably say nil-nil. Because um, so, <laughs> Saints are not scoring, well, they scored two at the weekend, but they're not scoring that many goals. And Brighton look defensively very strong, but don't score many goals. So I'd probably say an entertaining entertaining nil-nil, a good football, good footballing match, uh, a bit of a chess match. But... Um, well, I'm going to have to sit on the fence and say a draw, unfortunately. All right. Okay. Well, Dean, I, th- I think um, I think we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, you've heard it here, sir, first Saints fans. That, you know, it's going to be a nil-nil draw. Um, I think that, <laughs> that I think the away end is sold out for that. So. Um, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Don't hey, listen hey, to me. What do I know? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not involved in football at the moment. Don't listen to me. <laughs> Well, anyway, there's, I mean, there's lots of delights to be had in Brighton, some very good places to go drinking and, you know, nice to be on the seaside as well, even if it will be um, you know, towards the end of October. Um, 
Dean, thank you very, very much for having a chat with us. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Um, and I'm sure the fans will be delighted uh, you know, with this interview and, and will give us lots and lots of positive feedback. So thank you very much for coming on the show. My pleasure. My pleasure. Cheers, Dean. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.